the uh, Landau Center is the sponsorship of the Landau Lectures, which is basically uh, the, the center brings an internationally renowned mathematician uh, who does not have to be either German or Israeli. Nationality is uh, important in this case. To lecture, do a series actually of three lectures <coughs> on the topic of his or her choice. Uh, the first lecture is generally meant for a uh, wide mathematical or general mathematical audience, and the second and third lectures are can be more specialized than what we're on the lecture. The uh, previous Landau lectures have been uh, Professors Moser, Bambieri, uh, Sinai, uh, Lyons, and Thurston. And of course, most of you by now are probably aware that. Sinai was just uh, awarded the Wolf Prize in Mathematics together with Professor Joe Keller. Uh, Moser, after he was a Landau lecturer, also uh, was awarded uh, the Wolf Prize. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, Professor Tsafiri suggested that uh, we have a theorem here. Meant, this is simply meant to indicate the uh, quality of the uh, previous lecturers who have been our guests here in Jerusalem. This year's Lambda lecture is Professor Stefan Gildebrandt of the University of Bonn. His area of expertise, as I'm sure all of you know, is uh, minimal surfaces and calculus of variations. Uh, putting him in the company of the people who I already have, as part of the list of Landau lectures, already tells you uh, more than enough about him. Uh, I don't want to steal from his time, since he's going to use an hour lecture. I will only tell you that the uh, subject matter of his lecture today is uh, time factor estimation, spring cleanings principle, and path of variation, actually. Uh, that's today's lecture. There will be a subsequent lecture on Sunday, another one on Tuesday, which deal with nonlinear elliptic systems with partial differential equations and geometric variation or theory. And I hope that you will all uh, mark it down in your calendars and come. They will not be, those lectures will not be in this building. The lecture on Sunday is in the Levin building, two over. And the lecture on Tuesday is in Canada Hall, which is down at the entrance to the campus. So without any further ado, I give you Professor Wildebrandt, Landau Lecture. Thank you very much for your kind words. I thank the Landau Center for inviting me. This honor is certainly too great for me, but I will make the best of it. And uh, <clears throat> I have had been asked, as you heard, to give uh, my first lecture to a more uh, in, in, a, in a broader context. And so I decided uh, to give some 19th century mathematics, uh, which has been done this century, but uh, in, <laughs> in part the style is, uh, is all 19th century. And before I start, I should like to give you references in case you would like to, to read uh, what uh, I'm talking about. There's a paper in the Journal of Mathematical uh, Sciences of the University of Tokyo, volume one, page one to 21, 1994. And there's a paper in the Calculus of Variations, also a rather new journal, volume two, pages 249 till page 281. It's uh, 1995, no, it's also 1994. And uh, there's a book on the classical calculus of variations, uh, two volumes, and it's in volume uh, two, chapter 10, P1. 
appeared 1996 in the yellow series of Springer. <coughs> so this is uh, in case you would like to read more in detail of uh, what I'm doing today. There are many, many formulas I'm uh, going to write down, but I have no chance to derive them really. I just can give you an idea. Uh, the topic of my today's lecture is uh, Fermat's principle. the principle of Huygens. Uh, these two principles, uh, which are known to be uh, the fundament of geometrical optics, that is the simplest uh, optics where the light has wavelength zero, so to say the, the first step uh, or one could do. It's pure geometry. So Fermat's principle was derived uh, 1662. Uh, Fermat uh, wrote this principle down in a letter to the uh, physician of the king and of Card uh, Cardinal Mazarin. And uh, Huygens principle is in the book Traité de la Lumière from 1690. And Fermat's principle roughly says if you have a medium, an optical medium, and you have two points, how does light move? Well, uh, Fermat's proposal was light moves in such a way among all possible connecting passes between the two points that the time uh, which is needed for light thought as a particle, that the time is uh, minimal. Huygens' principle uh, was uh, the first introduction of light as a wave phenomenon. Huygens thought of light as uh, uh, longitudinal waves, and so Newton killed it right away. And we know that nowadays it's our transversal waves. Nevertheless, uh, the ideas are very useful. And what Huygens proposed is the following. Say you have a wave front, a signal front, which at a certain time, theta zero, has arrived at this type of surface. Then each point, uh, so to say, uh, is creating rumors. And the rumors spreading from these points uh, in little waves. And the light proceeds in such a way that you create the new wave front by forming always envelopes. And uh, doing this on an infinitesimal level, uh, so that only a time, an infinitesimal time, uh, the theta uh, has passed, uh, you get to a system of ordinary differential equations. And I'm going to write down this system of ordinary differential equations. And then, uh, of course, there's some way how light proceeds. And this is obviously, at the first look, completely different uh, from this. Now, <coughs> one knows uh, that this has played an important role to understand that these two uh, principles of describing light are equivalent in forming quantum mechanics in the work of the Boyle and so on. And uh, of course, one has to do it then for finite wavelengths, where this is only the zero's order of approximation. Um, <coughs> but to understand the uh, analytical procedure to show the equivalence between these two principles uh, has been an, a development of about 300 years. And uh, only step by step uh, this understanding has grown. And uh, before I start, really, uh, I would like to give you a, a brief account uh, because, as it happens, we are just 300 years after this important year, 1696. We have the Brothers uh, Bernoulli. Uh, 
had discussed the first problem in the calculus of variations. This is the problem if you have two points and you want to prescribe an arbitrary path and you let a little particle slide down under the influence of gravity which is going vertically, then you should find that path uh, such that uh, the particle goes down in the quickest possible way. Uh, now, uh, Johann Bernoulli, uh, in fact, used a principle of optics, uh, the refraction law of Snellius, to solve this problem combined with Fermat's law. So right away from the very beginning, the uh, calculus of, of variations and optics were related things. Then I men mentioned just uh, when the first textbook on the calculus of variations appeared in uh, 1744 uh, by Euler, and in 1756 um, <coughs> uh, Lagrange developed the well-known delta calculus that one learns in every course on the calculus of variations. So this is, so to say, the beginning of the, the formal apparatus of the calculus of variations, what one might think as a part of tensor analysis. Uh, now, uh, what one really wants is, uh, here one derives necessary conditions, say among all possible curves, or if it's in higher dimensional calculus of variations, among all possible surfaces uh, within certain boundary configurations to find those first which satisfy the Euler equations. These are the necessary conditions for a certain integral to be minimized. But then one really wants to know, is this extremal one has found, that is this solution of the Euler equation, is this really a minimum? Uh, of course, uh, the first thing, so this here might be first variation zero in this notation. Uh, then one probably would like to know is the second variation greater or equal zero? And does this imply that this is a minimum? Uh, actually, that is what uh, Jacobi thought, uh, but which turned out to be not true. And uh, it was Weierstrass who developed what is nowadays called a field theory. Uh, 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 and this field theory is used to establish the fact that a certain, that if certain conditions are satisfied for an extreme, that it's really a minimizer of a given functional. Uh, this is uh, after 1876 that this Weierstrass field theory uh, was developed. Weierstrass gave regularly uh, lectures on the calculus of variations, but during uh, his first lectures he did not have this right idea and only in a very well-known first lecture which uh, was worked out by famous people like Runge, who was one of the uh, as students who sat down and uh, had a hard time to understand what Weierstrass did. And only after some time, things became simpler and simpler. Uh, all these calculus of variations, one can say, uh, mathematicians have learned analysis. Uh, things that <coughs> Uh, that a directional derivative is very different from being a Frechet derivative. All such things have been understood the first time in the context of the calculus of variations. Actually, this was the mistake uh, Jacobi made. Uh, but before I go on, I should also mention the work of Hamilton and the work of Jacobi. Now, the first who really got an understanding of the equivalence in some sense between Hoek's principle and the Fermat principle was Hamilton in his famous theory of rays, uh, which he first worked out for uh, optics. And then he discovered that uh, what he had developed there was did as well apply to uh, mechanics. And Jacobi uh, read Hamilton's work, but 
more or less threw away the calculus of variations part and just uh, took the partial differential equations part and theory of canonical transformations. And so for a long time, uh, it was forgotten that uh, calculus of variations and partial differential equations of first order are something very related. And in the, <coughs> after 1870, I forgot the year, an astronomer of, uh, Leipzig University, Bruns, by the way, the teacher of uh, Felix Hausdorff, uh, developed in a very important paper something what he called iconal theory. Iconal means something like nice picture, beautiful picture. And uh, there he developed a new technique, which is so to say in between calculus of variations and Hamilton's theory. And uh, briefly after Bruns, paper very long had appeared, Felix Klein remarked uh, that essentially all is in the work of Hamilton, if one just had read it. And uh, Bruns was uh, very disappointed and uh, never wrote another paper on uh, this topic. Uh, <coughs> uh, so to say, Weierstrass field theory, to give you an idea uh, what one does there, and uh, I give you now an idea uh, which Weierstrass did not have in that form, which is basically Carl Theodoris. Picture combined with certain insights of uh, Hilbert uh, and the mathematician Adolf Meyer is the following. <coughs> uh, actually Gauss, uh, had this idea uh, earlier, and uh, <coughs> and the the procedure is as follows: given is an extremal, uh, so something which uh, makes the first variation of an integral zero. Uh, how can you decide that this extremal is actually a minimum? The idea is you choose or introduce uh, nonlinear coordinates in a very clever way. You introduce them in such a way that you embed the extremal in a field of extremal. That is, you have a certain family of uh, curves, all of them extremals, and which cover uh, the, the domain uh, so that through each point of a certain domain which you are considering, there passes only one extremal. Now, this is not enough for a field. Uh, this would just be what is what sometimes called an extremal field, but it has to be a Meyer field. Meyer field means that uh, certain integrability conditions have to be satisfied. Uh, that is, in the terminology of Lagrange, all the Lagrange brackets you can form with this family have to disappear. So to say, the flow must be created from what mathematicians nowadays call a Lagrange manifold. You take a Lagrange manifold as initial conditions and you let this flow. Uh, so this is the, these are the right coordinates. And um, in these coordinates, here you have this given extremal. And now you want to decide this. And then Hilbert proposed uh, the following way, which I'm not going to describe in detail. You t take the integral uh, i and you add another integral, i star. And this integral has a, a, a Lagrangian, that's an integral which is the so-called null Lagrangian. That is, uh, the extremals of this integral alone, uh, <coughs> all curves are extremals. All curves satisfy the Euler equations of this. So that uh, looks as if it would lead to nothing. You add something apparently very trivial to an integral. However, choosing this in a clever way, it turns out uh, you can, given the extremal, choosing the right Hilbert independent integral, you see something like this. You create a kind of transversal surfaces which also cover the domain, so you can imagine them like wave fronts which move over the domain, and the, the light, these are these uh, passes, the light passes uh, 
uh, intersect them transversally. Transversal has a different meaning from algebraic geometry, not just uh, angle, not just tangential, uh, more. It's a, a certain prescribed angle uh, with, that has been introduced by Adolf Knezer, uh, this terminology. Now, so you see, uh, you have connected with these bundles of, of light rays, you have connected uh, wave fronts, and these wave fronts satisfy a certain partial differential equation, and this equation is the famous Hamilton-Jacobi uh, partial differential equation, and uh, this has been brought together. Uh, and then you have what Cara Theodori called the complete picture of all. Well, in some sense, it's a complete picture, but it does not tell you why these wave fronts uh, are created by a Maupertuis principle. And uh, that remained unsolved except for special cases how, uh, how this works. And uh, the, f the first to see how this has been done was uh, Ernst Hölder in uh, 1939. Uh, and amazingly enough, uh, the development had to go further, namely, uh, Carre Theodori invented a kind of field theory for multiple integrals. For a long time, one did not know what to do. And I should mention there are these famous 23 problems of Hilbert, and the 23rd problem of Hilbert which is among all very precise problems. This is a very vague problem. The last problem he stated in Paris, and this says, well, develop the calculus of variations in a formal sense. He had two other problems, uh, problems 19 uh, and 20, and problems uh, 19 and 20 uh, more or less uh, contained a program of the so-called direct methods direct uh, methods of the calculus of variations, uh, which one could think of, of as a generalization of Dirichlet's principle for harmonic functions. Namely, that you get harmonic functions with satisfying boundary conditions by minimizing Dirichlet's integral. And uh, so from here uh, went, I think, the most important uh, development of the calculus of variations in this century. Uh, and it's amazing that Carl Theodori did never work on this part of the calculus of variations. Also, he was a master of the uh, measure and integration theory. And he, uh, what is nowadays called Hausdorff measure is, so to say, uh, inspired by by the work of, of Carl Theodori. Uh, this geometric, geometric measure theory, I think, comes directly out of the work of Carl Theodori. Uh, Carl Theodori, however, uh, chose to follow this 23rd problem, and in a long series of papers, he developed his ideas for one-dimensional and multi multi-dimensional problems. And between the years 1922 and 19 29, uh, uh, <coughs> saw how one could set up a field theory for multidimensional variational problems. And the basic idea he got was given extremal, you don't embed it into a field of extremals, this doesn't function in general anymore because certain integrability conditions which had to be satisfied will not be satisfied. However, what you can do is you can uh, set up a family, a multi-parameter family of transversal surfaces intersecting this extremal uh, surface and solving uh, or finding these transversal surfaces, you have to solve one partial differential equation uh, of the following type, uh, x, z, minus sx times sz to the minus one, uh, determinant sc plus one, equals zero. This is one partial differential equation uh, for 
n functions, as many functions as you have independent variables here. Now that might look uh, very strange to you, and in a way it is also a, a little bit strange. And this embedding problem has uh, only been solved locally uh, so far, uh, namely by Hermann Werner in the middle of the 30s. And in 1939 there is a paper by Ernst Hölder where he found a beautiful geometric method based on one-dimensional variational problems uh, by which he could uh, resolve this embedding problem. And having solved this embedding problem, uh, there is a way then uh, to set up uh, a procedure which decides that, that a certain uh, <coughs> given extremal is a local minimizer in the C0 topology locally. Uh, uh, I'm not going to write down the technical details. This is very long and very involved. I just would like to mention there is much later, about 10 years later, Hermann Weil derived the Nasser field theory in the early 30s, which is a uh, simpler than Hilbert's, uh, than Cara Theodoris. And uh, Weil also points out, in a way, it's a linearization. Cara Theodori has a, a non-linear, namely a determinant, as a non-linear function, as a <coughs> null function, which he adds, while Hermann Weil uses a divergence expression, a linear expression. Uh, however, in some respects, Cara Theodori's uh, theory is preferable uh, because uh, it applies to free boundary value problems, while bias theory only applies to fixed boundary values. Now, for, uh, for a while, the theory got stuck here, and only after 1970, uh, Herbert Federer, and then uh, Harvey and Lawson, and after that, many other mathematicians have developed a tool which is called calibration theory. <laughs> calibration theory. And this calibration theory is a, a very effective technical tool for, for, geomet for many geometric problems. And in a way, it can be uh, considered as the extension of the old uh, Cara Theodori Hilbert method. It's a, it's a technique which is, uh, works with differential forms and is well uh, adjusted to, to, to be written down in a coordinate invariant way. It's, it's a wonderful theory. But I stop here uh, with my, with my uh, general remarks and I just want to point out only if one, when one wanted to generalize this uh, multidimensional in, uh, this, uh, this one-dimensional theory to a, to a multi-dimensional one, uh, Hölder was able to see uh, what is behind. And behind everything is an application of uh, contact transformations. And uh, in this famous treatise by Cara Theodori on partial differential equations and the calculus of variations, the contact transformations uh, fill the whole first half of his book. And then when there comes the second part, one has the feeling the publisher has said, now it's enough what you have written. Uh, <laughs> there cannot be any more like this. He also states, uh, makes remarks like this. And so unfortunately, uh, this uh, a connection is suppressed in Carl Theodore's book. And uh, I would like to, to uh, bring it out. My time is running very fast, so I have to be a little bit quicker. Uh, contact transformations. Uh, 
what do I, do I mean by this? Let me think of a very Euclidean situation. I have an <coughs> n plus uh, one dimensional space, uh, which I call x z space. So x is in Rn, z is in R1. This is the configuration space. So z, well, maybe this way, z of x, uh, you could describe surfaces, hypersurfaces, say as graphs, z of u of x. And then uh, you have a contact space, which is m cross rn. This is an x, c, p space. So you have another capital N variables varying in here. Uh, this is, so to say, a phase space over the contact space. So you think of here, the, you just think here of the configuration space. You have a base point X C here, and over this you have a fiber over each point. Uh, and on this fiber S coordinates you have P. <coughs> now. Uh, you think of a contact form, omega, S dz minus uh, pi dxi. Let me write it as p scalar product dx. So this is the contact form. And now I want to define hypersurfaces in uh, uh, first, well, I want to go away from the, this space. Hypersurface can become very singular. If you think of a hypersurface, say something like a ball, a hypersurface uh, consists of its points and also of its tension planes. So it is uh, the envelope of a certain uh, set of, of planes, of hyperplanes. And now you assume that this hypersurface shrinks, uh, then it might happen that in the configuration space, if you suck the air out of such a ball, it just shrinks to one point, so there's not much left. But if you go to contact space, uh, you still have something like a star uh, in two dimensions. Uh, it's, a, it's a real star. Uh, <coughs> This is so to say everything what has been here is here and uh, if you go to this higher dimensional space there are no singularities in passing from this to this. It's a completely regular procedure and this is what Sophosley uh, had invented as a general notion of a surface and he called it element for line, but uh, shorter is if I call it n strip or just strip. So strip is a set, uh, n parameter set together with planes. So we can imagine that uh, such a strip is given by a mapping E from a n-dimensional parameter domain P into the contact space. And uh, strip means immersion. So the Jacobian has rank capital N and uh, <coughs> And I assume that it annihilates the contact form. Uh, that means you don't have something uh, which consists of points and tension planes which are just skew around, but always the tension planes are really tangent to the point set. So this is then the right definition of a hypersurface, or as I call it, a strip. Now. <coughs> Uh, there's something what I might call contact geometry in the sense of Felix Klein and contact geometry is geometry which preserves all contact. So you look for transformations uh, T uh, on the contact space into the contact space, so certain diffeomorphisms, uh, which uh, preserve the property of contact. That is, mappings which make out of strips, strips. So T maps strips into strips. 
the analytic condition for this is the following. If you pull back the contact form uh, on the, your image domain, you pull it back uh, by a T, then this is just proportional to the contact form. That is, there is a row different from zero such that the pullback is in proportion to this. So this is the analytic uh, description of contact forms. Now the next thing I would like to look at is one parameter groups of contact forms, of contact transformations. local one parameter groups around the identity. So think of the uh, sigma theta as a local one parameter group. That is, you have a solution uh, of a system of differential equations of this form where V is a vector field uh, on the contact space. Sigma is a function of theta dot means the derivative with respect to theta. <coughs> uh, now the question is uh, when uh, is such a, when does such a vector field create a one parameter group of uh, contact transformations? There's a theorem by Sophos Lee from 1888 and the statement is such a vector field creates a one parameter group of contact transformations if and only if if the coordinates of this vector field which I might call pi, phi and capital alpha are uh, generated by a single characteristic function fxcp so this is a scalar function on the domain where I'm considering the situation uh, I call this the Lie function in the following way uh, pi capital pi uh, no I call it just this is uh, the peak gradient of f uh, phi is p scalar with the peak gradient minus f and uh, alpha is minus fx minus p fz. fz is a scalar derivative. So uh, this tells you if and only if a is formed in uh, such a way from a single function f uh, then this creates a one parameter group a local one parameter group of contact transformations. <coughs> Um, now, uh, so we have here the system x theta, z, x dot, z dot, and the p dot, fp, p times fp minus f, and here we have minus fx minus p fz. That's, this is the system of uh, least differential equations. Now this is a very interesting system, namely uh, you certainly all have seen this system of differential equations without the f. Without the f it's just the system of characteristic differential equations for solving Cauchy's problem for a first order partial differential equation uh, <coughs> with a certain function f. And if you write down the characteristics, so you take your initial values, you extend them to a strip, and then you let flow the strip by the characteristics. And you, if you have no singularities, or as long as you have no singularities, you get a solution of this. And for this, you solve this system. Uh, Lee thought of using this system. Now, uh, if you have these equations, then f is just in a first integral of the equations. Uh, if you have this, f is not anymore a first integral. Nevertheless, if you have initial values on which f is zero, then it turns out if you let flow uh, by a one parameter group 
of uh, contact transformation. So here you have your initial values. You extend them to a strip and then you let it flow by uh, putting on it a one parameter group of uh, contact transformations. Then it stays zero all the way. Uh, what this one has to prove. And this way uh, Lee uh, got the solution of Cauchy's problem. But here he has uh, another description of, uh, or another image what these uh, equations mean. Uh, namely, this system of differential equations is uh, closely related to Huygens principle. Uh, why? Assume here you have your uh, wavefront as theta, and each point on the wavefront uh, there you have your elementary wave starting from. And then you would want to draw envelopes. And you think of this as infinitesimal elementary waves with which you have started. So here you have an elementary wave uh, <coughs> starting at a certain point, uh, EQ, uh, depending on, on theta, and you subtract uh, Q and you divide it by 1 over theta, and then you let uh, theta 10 to 0. So to say you blow the elementary wave up. Then you get some, you hope you get some uh, limit position, uh, which is a kind of integratrix. And this integratrix, uh, I move from Q to the origin, and I use as coordinates, uh, uh, so this is the origin. The point Q in which I have considered this is the point XC. So for each point, with each point Q here, there is connected an integratrix. And then I represent this integratrix in a non-parametric way. Uh, just think that everything I do here uh, is non-parametric. Uh, so here I have one scalar variable, zeta. Here I have n scalar variables, xi. And then zeta equals w of q, which functions as a parameter point, uh, xi. So fix q, and zeta as a function of xi gives you, say, this upper part of the integratrix. This is of this elementary wave. This is the, the limit of this blow up uh, procedure. And now, uh, you want to describe this surface in uh, dual coordinates by writing down envelopes. I have no, no time uh, to write it down. But if you do this, uh, then this is very much connected with uh, Legendre's, Legendre's transformation. And in Legendre's transformation, uh, you have the following. Uh, <coughs> You, uh, you have a set of variables uh, x, c, and xi. The xi has this meaning here. And you have a function w, depending on these variables. And then you make a Legendre transformation that is rather a partial Legendre transformation by 
This is, if you think of the picture configuration space, here's the base point Q, and then you change variables in the fiber. That is, you go from variables Xi to new variables P. Uh, but of course, it's a different transformation because in general, if you change the base point. So the transformation changes with the base point. And this transformation, uh, I write you down uh, the formulas which need some interpretation. The interpretation is the following. Uh, w x c xi plus f x z p e equals uh, p times uh, xi, then <coughs> p is the xi gradient of w, xi is the uh, p gradient of f, and then you have formulas of the type x gradient of w plus x gradient here. I have not written the in parentheses the variables anymore. This is zero and wz plus fz equals zero. So these are in a somewhat cryptical forms, form, the formulas which describe the Legendre transformation, which show you that the Legendre transformation is an involution. If you apply it twice, uh, uh, you get the same result. So, for instance, if you start uh, with W, then the procedure is as follows. Fixing X and Z, you introduce in the fiber new variables pi. Then you introduce a new function F as this minus this, which of course then depends also on Xi. You have to get rid of Xi, so you have to invert this in terms, uh, you have to write xi as a function of p, and this you insert here. And these are the formulas. And you can go the way back, doing the same with f. Uh, and uh, <coughs> uh, this way, uh, this way the Legendre transformation is defined. So you have always to think uh, the variables of w are these, and the variables of f are these, and they are not free, but they are coupled with each other according to this rule. And it uh, doesn't play a role in whether this or this is the independent variable. So, uh, if it's the way I have uh, written it, as I have described it here, then it's the Legendre transformation created by W, and the inverse Legendre transformation is the Legendre transformation of F, uh, which is just the inverse uh, of this one. So you have a way to take a scalar function uh, and to create a certain transformation. It turns out that if you describe uh, the procedure of forming the envelopes uh, according to Huygens principle, you end up exactly with the system of least differential equations. The so system of least differential equations are the exact descriptions of Huygens uh, principle. Uh, now, Locked when I started. Unfortunately, how much do I have? Good, thank you. Uh, now I want to write down what I call uh, the fourfold picture of the calculus of variations. Uh, I start with picture one down here because this is the picture one usually considers. So here you have a Lagrangian. You have a function x of z. Write it for reasons of symmetry in a very strange way that the independent variable comes after the dependent. And uh, here comes uh, uh, v of z which is x prime z. x prime is the, the derivative with respect to z. So if you want to make this stationary, uh, you end up with the Euler equations. Mm. 
which is this set of equations. Now, uh, then one learns if one makes Legendre transformation uh, from here to here, the Legendre transformation uh, generated by L, uh, one ends up with the canonical equations. So these are, so to say, the differential equations for the race. And then one has Hamilton-Jacobi uh, partial differential equation. Which is this equation. And H is just a Legendre transform of L. I forgot to say here, if you make this procedure, you start with a function uh, W and you create a new function of this type, it's called the Legendre transform of W. So here, the Hamilton function is the Legendre transform. It's the Legendre transform of uh, the Lagrange, of the Lagrangian. And uh, you wonder where this differential equation uh, has remained. Well, it turns out uh, <coughs> that this partial differential equation goes over in a system of highly degenerate uh, differential e partial differential equation of first order, n plus one. Uh, and they have inter been introduced by Kara Theodori in his book and he calls them the fundamental uh, differential equations of the calculus of variations. And so to say, a large part of the development of, uh, of control theory, Bellman theory and such things, uh, have been inspired actually by Carl Theodori. And uh, the inspiration comes from this different view of the Hamilton-Jacobi uh, equation. So this is the standard picture you always see. And then I write three more pictures. And uh, this is the picture uh, which has been seen by, by Helder. I reverse the, the arrow here and rather write the arrow in this direction and then the Legendre transform generated by H. Now, uh, here I should say you have variables H, X, Z, Y. Y are the Legendre transformed variables of this. Here you have uh, L, X, Z, V. Now, it turns out if you start uh, the way I have described it with Huygens' principle, that is you start here, with the function w x psi, and then by Legendre transformation you create a function f x c p. Uh, then you can reversing the picture. You can write it like Legendre transform of f, and then you can draw two arrows here. And uh, it turns out this diagram commutes. Uh, so here is a certain transformation, which I call HF, uh, call it Helder transformation, and this I call HW. And here is a certain transformation, which is little known, uh, which has been introduced by Adolf Haar in 1928 for a completely different purpose, for studying two-dimensional uh, uh, variational integrals. Uh, the goal of Haar was he wanted <coughs> to generalize certain results from minimal surfaces to uh, the extremals of two-dimensional variational problems of this type. And for this purpose he invented uh, what I want to call Haar's transformation. And uh, it turns out this transformation, which I call Rf, Haas transformation generated by F, uh, is either this product or it's uh, this product. Now, uh, the amazing thing is 
that the Lie equations uh, which you have here uh, are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the Hamilton equations. Of course, you have different independent variables. So you have not only to change uh, the dependent variables as described, and I have not said to you what the Hölder transformation is. So um, maybe I'll write it down here. This transformation HF uh, takes points of this type and maps it into points with the same base and the variable in the fiber is y and uh, you create a new function HXCY from FXCP uh, in the following way. <coughs> Uh, you define a mapping which maps pi into y uh, equals pi divided of fxcp and uh, h x z and y is 1 over f of x, c, and p. So this you have read again to read again in the following way. You make this transformation, then you invert it, fixing x and z. You uh, resolve it p as a function of y. Uh, this you have to insert here, and then you get a function h. Uh, if you do this, uh, <coughs> Then you have described this transformation and in a similar way uh, this transformation and the hard transformation is this one. Uh, now then it turns out that if you introduce C uh, as a function of theta uh, by this variable, and then you reverse it, write theta as a function of c, and introduce it, then uh, these equations are completely equivalent uh, to these equations. Uh, and the equivalence of this equation uh, here, in this picture over here, is an equation which has been discovered uh, by the French mathematician Vassio in the beginning of this century. It's the equation f of x z minus s x divided by s z times s z plus one equals zero. And if you look at this, then you see that Carl Theodore's equation, which I had mentioned in the beginning, is so to say the multidimensional generalization of SEO's equation. Whether Carl Theodore got the idea from here or not, I have no way to say. Anyway, that was the way how Helder proceeded. And uh, he so to say used this one dimensional idea by filling up n minus one variables in, this, in an arbitrary way and then uh, he resolved uh, one specific equation of this type to get the solution of uh, Carl Theodore's equation and this way resolving the embedding problem. Now, uh, I have not uh, written down to you the differential equations here. Uh, I had thought that was a complete desideratum in literature. Uh, so to say, this picture did not exist. But looking careful, I discovered this Gustav Herklotz in his famous lectures, which in the meantime have been published, his lectures on the mechanics. He has uh, discovered uh, the differential equations which come out of least equations by Legendre transformation. Uh, and the only thing which never appeared in literature is so to say the equivalent of this equation or 
of the uh, Vesio equation or of the uh, uh, Cara Theodori fundamental equation in my picture number four. So I was very proud that I found in this, on this holy ground, one cent of differential equations, which has not yet appeared in 300 years. Uh, and uh, I have not, uh, no time to go into the details. I can tell you only uh, that, so to say, in each picture, you have the duality between rays and wave fronts, uh, but in different ways. And each picture has a different advantage or disadvantage. And uh, what is new here also is that in the standard considerations, uh, you only know that you can carry out these transformations locally. Uh, and uh, I have discussed the matter and found uh, a way to write down global conditions. So this, that these globally are equivalent pictures. And strangely enough, uh, uh, to carry out this transformation, you need just two scalar assumptions f different from zero and phi different from zero. And phi is what I call the adjoint function of f. I had written down it already. It's p times f p minus f. This is a characteristic analytic expression which turns up again and again. And if I assume these two things, then the Helder transformation is uh, invertible globally. For this to have uh, to be able to invert it globally, I can assume, for instance, that the Hessian with respect to p is definite. And of course, I need some assumptions on the domain. So either positive definite or negative definite, uh, which agrees uh, very well with the geometric imagination one has of these elementary wave fronts. Now, uh, the amazing fact is once you assume this condition and this condition in one of the four corners, it holds for the corresponding functions h, l, w in all the other corners. This is not a simple fact. There are something has to be proved. Uh, so, but uh, I have done it, and after I, I had derived these facts, uh, a student of mine gave uh, Mr. Clarence in his diploma paper, gave a nice <coughs> uh, characterization of my assumptions in terms of the so-called uh, figuratrix, uh, which uh, Herr uh, Minkowski had introduced in, into the calculus of variations. Uh, <coughs> Uh, well, I think I'd better stop here. Thank you for your attention. this century. Uh, remember I had problems number 19 and uh, 20. And of course the beginning of, of uh, this uh, was Hilbert's, uh, Hilbert's description of the problems. <coughs> Well, and then one has to, uh, to speak of Leon Lichtenstein, and uh, from Lichtenstein comes Mori, and uh, Mori then comes certain all sorts of notions of convexity, and there's this uh, convexity notion that Mori called quasi-convexity, which is nowadays very much used in continuum mechanics. This is what John Ball did in his uh, thesis. Uh, but this is a completely different line uh, of analysis. I spoke of problem 23, which is uh, the formal uh, completion of the calculus of variations. So to say, all what you have seen here is juggling around with formulas and interpreting them in geometric way. So to say, everything is really geometric, every formula uh, my time is too short. I have to, could run down for many hours. Uh, everything has uh, beautiful geometric pictures, uh, very refined uh, pictures, and they are expressed by these uh, classical uh, formulas, some of which I have uh, 
to describe here and I used the more known formulas to remind you of something you know already.